Are you ready to think big and act bold? Then you are in the right place. This is Innovative Entrepreneurs, a podcast that will bring you the stories, insights, and tips from some of the most successful and innovative entrepreneurs in the world. I am your host, Erica Bailey, and I am here to help you start, scale, and sustain your own entrepreneurial journey. Let's get started. Today, we have a very special guest, Alex McPodar. First off, I'm going to jump in. I'll tell you all about Alex, but we had to reschedule multiple times because of things that were happening in my life. And I've never been treated with such kindness and love and understanding. So I'm going to start with that and say that you are an amazing human being because of just, just your kindness. And so I appreciate that. Of course, <laughs> we're all going through it, of course. Um, you know, Alex is the CEO and co-founder of Backyard Bookkeeper. It's a company that provides bookkeeping services and financial consulting to businesses of all sizes. Uh, it started in 2008, has almost 50 employees and helps hundreds of clients nationwide. Alex is really passionate about building businesses and bringing people together in ways that help them. That. I love that. That's what I want to do too. Uh, she loves advising startups and helping new entrepreneurs get their feet off of the ground. Like there is so much synergy here. It's totally different than business type, but I think like the way we do business is really out of kindness and love. And that's what I'm seeing. And that's what I'm feeling. She recently as one of Utah's 40 over 40, an award that recognizes leaders who have made significant contributions to their communities. Uh, she is a person who prioritizes taking action over merely talking about it. Alex, thank you for joining us today. Finally, thank you for having me. Yay, we made it. Yay, we finally did it. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you so much. So, Alex, like, how did you become an entrepreneur? Like, where was the transition? Did you always want to do this or? You know, how did you decide you wanted to go out on your own? Um, it started very early in my age. I have grown up in a very poor family back in Hungary. Um, and uh, well, I'm originally from Romania, but I grew up in Hungary. We moved after the 1989 um, fiasco back in Eastern Europe. Okay. And um, I kind of I had to take care of me. You know, I had to take care of me. I had to find ways to buy my own school supplies. I had to find ways to pay for my lunch or my breakfast because my parents just didn't have it. They didn't have, they, you know, we, they were living from paycheck to paycheck. So I had to find ways. Um, so it started pretty early in first grade. Oh, wait, what did you do in first grade? That was a lot of things. You know, I'm an observer. So in the 90s, I don't know if you remember, there used to be those little phone cards. <laughs> yeah. You pop in and, you know, after coins, we had the little phone cards. Now those phone cards used to have different pictures on them. And kids started to collect them and exchange them or sell them. I mean, either sell them or exchange them for breakfast. Oh, my gosh. That is brilliant at such a young age. Wow. Okay. Now take us through the rest of that entrepreneurial journey. Like how did you get to where you are now? And, uh, you know, what was your why? Why did you, I kind of done, you see the why already. Like you said, you had to feed yourself. You had yeah. to take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, well, but what was yeah. your why to do this to, to grow where you are? So the why is very simple. I think some people have a why of either it's family or they want to get out of a box that they've been put all of their lives. Or in some cases, like in my case, it was a need, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had very, very good jobs in my, my entire life. I've never, like my first job, my first full-time job was when I was 14. I was working for McDo McDonald's. Thing. Mm -hmm. I said it right. And so I never had a job that I didn't like. But I always had side hustles. I always wanted to make more to be able to help my family. At age 14, I was pretty much sending back money to my parents. I was taking care of my sister. I was, it's for me personally, it was a need 
Um, it really, really changed. One day, um, I was having a conversation with one of my uncles, and we were I was renting a room from him, and he basically chewed me out because I was about a week late with my rent. And he said, why are you? At that point, I was having like, I think, three full-time jobs. And he was like, you have this many jobs. You work so many hours, and you can't pay me my rent. Why don't you care about it? And I said, well, as far as I can buy my Coke and my favorite candy, I'm fine and pay your rent, I'm fine. And even though he meant it in a, you know, teachable moment or like a criticism, what he said was like, well, if you don't care about money, why would money care about you? And that was so shocking to me. Okay, if you don't care about money, why would money care about you? Okay, I'm trying to put that together, okay? Yeah. So if you don't care about money, why would money come to you, right? Because you will not put the real value on it. And it was so shocking to me. And I realized, you know what? He's absolutely right. If I don't care about changing my own life and making more money, why do I expect money to just come to me? And it's, I think this is the big problem with a lot of people is that we just expect things to come to us, right? And then we don't really put the value on those things that we want to come to us because we don't go out there. It's like buying that favorite toy for your kid, right? In two days, it's going to be broken. But if you make them go and do some chores in the house, guess what? They will appreciate it so much more. This has to do with money. This has to do with our lives. If we actually put in the effort, we will appreciate it more. So that goes with money too. If you put in the effort, you will appreciate it so much more. That's what really changed me. That's when I really started thinking about like, okay, how I have a full-time job. How can I make more money? So my my mom was a massage therapist. Okay. And um, she, through her, I also got a massage therapy certificate. And I said, you know what? That's a really good way for me to make some more money and also help people. So I went out and started my own business. I became a massage therapist. When I sold my business, I sold over 400 clients. And I was 18 years old. Okay. Everybody's fine. Saying, Alex. So, like, did you learn this from your parents, or is this literally self-taught from first grade hustles? I mean, at at eighteen years old, you sold a business with five hundred massage clients. About four hundred. Four hundred. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, how did you learn to do this? This is insane. Uh- I got my first client and I was very lucky. I said, I'm going to go. And this was then the time of no TikTok, no social media, no websites, no nothing, just flyers. Okay. And um, I got my first client. I said, I'm just going to go on the street. And as soon as I see somebody limping, I'm going to approach them and ask them why they're limping. So this, I had a couple of older ladies as massages in the church environment where I was. They were my clients, but I wanted something bigger. I wanted more. And this guy at the Trump station, he was coming towards me and he was leaping. He was in his 40s. Okay. And I went up to him and I said, you know, I had to call my courage that I had. And I went up to him and I said, why are you limping? And we started a conversation and it turns out that he was a soccer coach. He was coaching okay five soccer teams, including the national Hungarian soccer team. And uh, he had an accident and he kept going to chiropractors and going to everything and they could just not get the limb. So Alex being Alex, I said, I can't fix that. He's like, no, you know, you can. I said, yes, I can. Here's the thing. I will come to your house i have a package of 10 massages i will give you five for free and you will pay for the other five if you think that it's been helping you and within five massages his limp was gone and instead of him paying me for the other five he took me in and i got all five of the teams oh wow it started that's yeah it's like i want to heal somebody i want to grow like like i want to be badass you know don't get me wrong I love it. I love it. I love it. That expansion started with a moment of kindness, right? And I just had a conversation with somebody else and we were talking about the hardest part to do is to 
get out of the car or open the door or approach the person. That's like the hardest step. After that, everything's, you know, kind of a piece of cake. And that's what it sounds like happened with you. It's like, okay, all right, I got to approach this guy and and look at what happened from that moment of fear turned to kindness, turned to action. I believe very highly that everything is energy around us. So yeah. whatever energy you go into a situation, that's the energy you will receive back. So my purpose was to just get rid of his limb. I knew I could get rid of his limb. That was my purpose, to just prove to him that it can be done even though he spent hundreds and hundreds of foreigns on chiropractors and other things. And yes, at, at the end of the day, it's all about kindness and believing in yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So I sold my business when I was 18. I went and I, I served a mission for my church. Oh. And then in 2005, I moved to the U.S. My mom died. Um, and that was very, very hard for me. And... Um, it kind of was like an escape. Most of my friends were here in the U.S. And so a bunch of my friends got together and um, paid for my first semester of school. Oh. And then I went out and I got a job. Even though I was not qualified to get the job, I still got the job. Um, and I hustled through it. And then in 2008, um, my business partner, who we started the Backyard Bookkeeper, I'm not an accountant, though I have an accounting certificate. Yes, I do. I'm a business owner. I know how to grow businesses. I know how to sell myself. So when I saw her being so obsessed with QuickBooks, mm -hmm. uh, while I was figuring out Facebook at the time, I said, you know what? I want to make money off of you. Okay. That's it. I want to make money off of you. I'm going to go out and sell you. Oh, <laughs> Wow. And so that's how we started. She went and then she started um, getting a couple of part-time jobs as contractor. And then I had to convince her to hire our first employee. But my my mission was, number one, to create jobs I've never had, which is, you know, not be uh, micromanaged, not be like somebody standing behind you with a whip and like, you know, telling you every step of the way what to do. So for me, my mission was to create a job. For her was to educate. Um, and then that's how my passion came, which is I'm also educating, but I'm not educating about like bookkeeping. I'm educating about why is it important to have a good bookkeeper, right? Right. So. Right. Her, and yeah. Most businesses fail within five years because they have a really dumb relationship with money. Okay. Whatever relationship you had with money as a child, whatever relationship you had with money before you started a um, um, business, once you start making a ton of money, that's exactly the relationship you're bringing in. So if you spent a ton of money before and not looking, you will spend a ton of money in your business if you're not looking. But if you have a good bookkeeper, it can stop you and say, hey, you want to buy this new office check? Do you really need it? Because this is what it's going to do to your profit and loss. Wow. So I think I need to talk to you. <laughs> I think I need a book, a new bookkeeper. <laughs> I have 50 of that. <laughs> okay, I think it's yours. You don't like <laughs> So, I mean, what makes you guys different then? Like what, what makes your business different than that somebody else? So number one, um, we are the largest solo bookkeeping firm that does not have any other services. We really stick to what we are. There are a ton of other accounting companies, and especially in the past 10 years, there was a huge boom in the market. Everybody's buying accounting services. Everybody's looking for it. But that's because of what the upscale, like CFO services, fractional CFOs, fractional uh, 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 controller, and all of these other jobs. We only stick to bookkeeping. Okay. And the reason for that is because we want to create Number one, jobs that people love to work. If you go into work and you have a stomach ache or you have a, a knot in your stomach, it doesn't matter how much raises I give. Those people will quit. It doesn't matter how much I'm trying to uh, motivate them. 
if they have a stomachache and they do not like their job, they will quit. Mm-hmm. So the number one thing that we are different is we're sticking to what we're really good at. And that is bookkeeping. Mm-hmm. Understanding on how to be with a business from the very beginning till they make multi-million dollars. You know, and there is nothing more exciting than to see a small business owner become a big business owner. And we have clients who have taken us during these 15 years. They're still our client today. And every single time another service comes in and says, you need to bring it in house. You need to do this. They always say, no, backyard bookkeeper has been there for me from the very beginning. I'm sticking with them. Oh my gosh. I love that. Yeah. We have, we have a two clients that are like that, that we've been with forever and ever and ever. It just feels good, right? You know, you're doing a good job and just, yeah. you know, when they built that trust and respect with you, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful. So or they know that you care about their business. Yes. At the end of the day, we all have dirty laundry. <laughs> yeah. Especially in your finances, you know, they have to build the trust to be able to talk to you about it. Yeah, you're, you're pretty awesome. So I guess my qu- another question is, I mean, you started as an entrepreneur in first grade. I, I'm sure you've made mistakes along the way. Like, can you share like one maybe with us and maybe what you did to, to get over that adversity? Yeah, how you got through that, that adversity? Um, we made a lot of mistakes. Not one. I'm especially not one. I made a lot of mistakes. Number one, um, my relationship with money. I come from a very poor family. So what meant is every penny that came in has also been spent. And there was not a mindset of saving. There was no money to save. Even though it doesn't matter how much money you make, you can still save. I guarantee you can still save. So that was one thing is um, every penny, especially because we boot, bootstrapped the business, like literally for 15 years, my budget budget for marketing is about $49 a month. Everything else I'm done myself. I learned how to do a website. I've learned how to do SEO. I learned how to do a social media. I learned, I, I, I've done everything. But the hardest and the biggest mistake, and I, this is, I think, that every entrepreneur when they start a business needs to know or educate themselves. And that is, number one, is the relationship with money. Okay. Be very clear about what your relationship with money is. Because, again, if you spend mo- a lot of money before, you will spend even more money once the money comes in. Two, knowing how to hire right. Okay. We had two big 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 fails in hiring the first person that we hired and you know i will never talk bad about her because it was not her it was us um she was perfectly presented dressed for the interview and we were so excited you know and then when we actually sat her down and gave her work to do she was typing like this so who is at fault her because she was typing like this or me for not testing her typing skills. Oh, okay. Okay. You know? Yeah. So a lot of people, when they hire, they don't think about like, um, you have this like, am I allowed to test the people? Yes, you are. If you go to any big corporation to work for Apple, to Coke or anything, especially Apple, the interview process is nothing else. You go into a whiteboard, and they make you write down the code right there and there. There is nothing wrong with you testing and making sure that you hired the right people. So that was my biggest. And the way we came out of it is that we looked at what the mistake was and we learned our mistakes. And then the next hire was better. And then the next hire was better. And then the next hire was better. But if you hire the wrong people, your business will never grow. People, you need to rewind about mm, two minutes and and listen to that again because that was pretty powerful. So, what type of leader are you? How that that's a better way, I guess, to say it. I think you know, if you go and you ask um, most of our employees, they would say that I'm the clown because my CEO title does stand for Chief Executive Officer. It stays for Chief Executive Clown. 
I I love making people smile. I love making them feel comfortable around me. I love trying to be their friend. Um, But I also can be very bossy. And that sometimes comes through because I'm European. I grew up in completely different systems with different expectations. Yeah. So I know for a fact that I can be a jerk, even though I don't mean to be a jerk. Okay. Uh, One of the biggest criticism that I have received, and the reason why I want to talk about like what's my negative as a leader is because I think that explains that I am very aware of what I need to be changing. Yeah. Then if I'm aware of what I need to be changing, I know how to look in my people and how to encourage them to make that change in themselves. Yeah. You know, so one of the biggest criticism that I've, I'm, I've been receiving was that I only see things in negative. And that really, that really hit me because it is very true. But that's not because I'm a negative person. It's because if you bring me a problem, once you said that magic word, this is a problem and it needs a solution, I forget about all the good stuff around the problem. I go into fixing the problem. So the only thing I see is the problem. Does that make sense? Because I have to fix it, not tomorrow, not in a week. I have to fix it now, and I need the solution now. So that makes me look like I'm a train that comes through and bulldozes everything. And sometimes I am at fault because I don't acknowledge all the good stuff. Because even problems have good stuff around them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you learn from the problems, right? <laughs> That's my biggest mistake. It's my biggest weakness is that I, I I come in like a train sometimes and I I don't acknowledge the positive things. Um, but I'm not doing it on purpose, you know. But I've observed this and I'm learning from it and I'm trying very hard to be more uh, positive and first acknowledge the good stuff and then go into like, okay, this is the problem. How are we going to solve it? I love that. Yeah, because... I like to, I even say it to my kids, I'm like, if you have a problem, great, come to me with the problem, but you need to have a solution with that problem. The yeah. solution mindset, most of the people who succeed in life are because they're, they're solution oriented. And I'm a very solution oriented person. No, obviously you've succeeded since first grade. That still blows my mind. <laughs> so there's a question here that says, you know, what are some books or resources that ha- influenced you personally or your professional growth? So you sound like you have a very open mindset in regards to visually seeing your goals and, and achieving them and just, you know, knowing where you want to be. So, I mean, did you just grow up like that or do you have some resources no. that, that you that you like that that have helped you? No, um. Because I grew up in poverty, and my poverty compared to other poor children, it was nothing. I still had a very good life. I was very independent. My curfew was basically when the sun went down, and I was very independent. I was a martial artist. I did martial arts till I was 17 years old. I had an accident, so I had to stop. Well, I didn't have to stop. I quit. And that was that's my biggest regret in life, by the way. But when I became very religious, and I'm not afraid to admit this because I think we all have it. Yeah. Um, we're, we're having a chat here. I don't, if somebody doesn't like what we say, they can just turn it off. <laughs> all, we all have, I think we all have multiple lives that we're living at the same time. And let me explain what what I mean. Okay. Um, And now I'm in a certain way with your husband. And you're a completely certain way with your kids. And you're a certain way with your parents. And you're a certain way with your friends. That's one person, yet you're still acting in different ways. Because different people need to see you in different ways. We accommodate to what those people want. Do you agree with me so far? Yeah. Sometimes I believe that people fall on the other side, which is being too accommodating. 
Uh, when I joined the religious organization, I've observed that the people around me love to help. And so I fell into that trap of basically getting positive attention to being pitied. Okay. So in some ways, I would talk only about bad things in my life to get a shoulder pass saying, Alex, you're okay, and everybody else is bad. And that got to a point where I basically had no idea who I was um, because I stopped doing what I really cared about, which was martial arts, which kept my brain focused. Mm -hmm. And I just only went for that positive attention of being pitied. I didn't call it pitied. I later discovered Understood it. Yes. Yeah. But I was, you know, if some of my friends wanted to see me laughing and being happy and cheerful. I was happy and cheerful. But then I had the other friends who loved, well, not loved, but they thought I was this little poor child who her mother didn't have a good relationship with her. And and I milked it for every penny that I got, right? Um. So what the change has happened, and you're going to laugh. Have you seen Runaway Bride? Yes, yes. Remember when Richard Gere sits her down and says, Julia Roberts and says, here are all the eggs. You've been eating your eggs the way your boyfriend liked it all your life. You have no idea what you like. And she was trying to convince him, no, I like poached egg, that I cooked that, I like this. And that opened my eyes. I realized I have no clue why. Okay. Because every person loved me for different reasons. Yeah. But all those reasons were... I was allowing them to see me in a certain way because that's what they needed to see. And that's when I realized, I don't know who I am. I need to go to the drawing board. I need to find myself. I need to figure it out. So I went to the drawing board and instead of starting to read books that were fantasy or horror or crime or whatever, I started picking up self-motivating books, mm -hmm. self-discovery books. And slowly I realized I really have no idea how I like my eggs. So I went back to the drawing board and I started t testing the eggs and I started figuring it out. And so self-motivating books, business books, I realized, you know, my head is business. I love puzzles. I love solving puzzles. I love bringing them together. So there is nothing better for me than you giving me a true story of somebody who made it because I read it. I don't just read it and put it on the shelf. I read it and I apply it. And that's the secret. Okay. There's as many books as you want, but if you just read it and put it on the shelf and talk about it for two days, you're gone. It's, it's gone. You need to apply it. That's when it becomes powerful. So one of these books, since you asked, is actually... Um, by Michael Gerber. It's my business Bible. It's called Emit, Why Most Businesses Fail Within Five Years. It's a really, really good book. I'm writing that one down. <laughs> it's it's um, basically making a point that your business needs to be independent on you and that most business owners, most small business owners, while you start out, you have to wear a lot of hats, especially if you bootstrap your business. But once you realize what those hats are and you systemize them, you have to give it to others. And at some point, you have to make way for you to get out of the business and let the child grow by itself. Okay. I gotcha. I mean, this is impressive. This is why I say that, you know, you're not really a business owner till you hire your first person. Oh. You're just not. I mean, you can make as much money, but at the end of the day, you're just employing yourself. Once you are responsible for somebody else's well-being, brain nutrition, and lifting them up, then your business can truly become its own entity. Wow. So, what, I mean, what do you think entrepreneurs need? Like, what do you think is essential for an entrepreneur in order for them to succeed? The mindset of solutions. Mindset of solutions. Wow. But here is another thing. A lot of people don't understand the difference between entrepreneur and business owner. Okay. An entrepreneur starts businesses and the goal is to sell it. Okay. A business owner starts businesses and wants to finish them, meaning I'm starting it here and I'm going to grow it and I'm going to be there my entire life. Okay. An entrepreneur usually 
buys businesses, um, builds them up, resells them, goes out, buys more businesses. And that's why entrepreneurs, they're brave. I'm an entrepreneur. That's why I have five businesses. I keep starting a world. <laughs> I just got started. You know, I keep starting new ones. A lot of people don't know the difference. And no. entrepreneurs, we want out. We don't want to. Even though I've been I've been doing this business backyard bookkeeper for fifteen years, um, I have a couple more years of me, and then I I need out. I need yeah. to build it in the place where it doesn't need me anymore. I need out. I need to do the other ones. I mean, isn't that our our goal, right? Is that you can have these businesses run for them, you know, run themselves so that you can just be out, you know what I mean? You can't live your life and, and not have to worry too much, you know what I mean? Because you're able to separate yourself from your business. It's my goal. It's a must. Yeah. It's a must. Yeah. You have to. You have to allow the business to grow by itself. So who do you think is the most influential entrepreneur for you? Like who has influenced you most and why? Uh, <laughs> Gary V. I love him. <laughs> and I love him because he doesn't bullshit. No. Do I believe that he's the greatest um greatest leader and that all of his employees love him and all of these things? No. But he doesn't bullshit. Yeah. And yeah. he's self-made just like I am. Yeah. I, I do consider myself sometimes I've been commenting on his post sometimes and say, hey, I'm your sister from another mother you've never met. I'm your. I, <laughs> I love cursing. Oh. oh, I don't do it in front of my no. people. You make me giggle. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I just, I love that his whole management Still, like his whole management of all of his business is really based on kindness. And it all started back from, I tell the story all the time, but I hear it from him. Um, all started back when he was a young boy. He opened the door for somebody and his mom like praised him like he won the Nobel Peace Prize is what he said. And so I believe that his that moment um, triggered literally the rest of his life as to how he wanted to treat other people. And so the fact that he really is, um, you know, believes in in human kindness, um, that's what I love about him. Absolutely. And you know what? He doesn't bullshit. And I think, that we, I think we need some of that. I think we need people to start, you know, pulling the veils out of in front of our faces and, and you know. I believe that the key to his success, um, and we can do a whole entire podcast just on Gary Vee, but it's mm -hmm. the it's the thing that I was just telling you about how you live multiple lives for multiple people. And then you're just confused about who you really are. Mm -hmm. He's never changed who he was. He never gave up on swearing. Even though he got a lot of criticism, he said, I don't give a, I don't give a fuck. We're <laughs> saying it. Um, um, he never changed his subjects. Mm -hmm. He's never changed his speaking style. He's never changed his clothing. He's never changed, like, he just did not buy into this, like, you need to look a certain way, you need to dress a certain way, you need to be speaking a certain thing. He never changed his, he figured it out who he is, and he's yeah. stickled to it with his friends, with his family, with his business associates. He's just, he figured it out, and he doesn't bullshit. He doesn't care. Yeah, and that's what I strive for. He is. So I'm a people pleaser. I'm a huge people pleaser. But I have noticed what I can please and what I cannot please. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm starting to figure that out too. He's coming yeah, those, yeah. to yeah. Utah to two events. Sarah's life? Yeah. I'll, send, I'll, send, I'll email you the link. Yeah, totally. I'll advertise that for free. Hey, I've got a thing. If you get this and you want to give us free tickets. All right. Yeah, and we'll take them. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Come job, boy. Oh, man, that would be amazing. You know, I like authentic people. The ones that are going to are gonna build our futures, you know what I mean? And it's it's going to start also 
Um, we need to build our, our young generation up to be authentic and to be real, to be kind, um, but also, you know, be able to solve problems. I think that's where we're going to have a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, personally, I think that it's right. solving problems is a, is a challenge right now for the younger generations. It's really darn hard. Um, I don't have kids. Um, I have dogs. I have a horde of children. I'm 50 employees. I'm with 50 employees. There you go. That's there you go. That's your kids. <laughs> I'm being called the mama bear in the company. <laughs> um, but this influence of what I was, you know, I, I go back to that influence of like being a, such a people pleaser that you fall on the other side. It's one thing to be a people pleaser with real people, but man, it's another beast to be a people pleaser for social media. Yeah. You said and it. and you have- your whole life is all about how many likes you get, how many comments you get, how many, mm-hmm. and then you're on top of that, you are motivated by making money out of those likes. And I don't even know if I were a, a, a parent, how I would even start to teach them about what kind of eggs they like because they have no idea do they even know how eggs look like probably not you know that's that's a really i really like what you said erica is that we you know uh, authentic people we need to put our authenticity out there we need to stop caring about the likes and the comments and here's the thing you have a podcast and you have your marketing agency and you know you see all these trends right right um but sometimes i'm i'm mind blown i post a lot of like straightforward things to linkedin Mm -hmm. um and i sometimes i don't get likes right and then i meet somebody at a conference who runs up to me and says alex i just absolutely love your down-to-earth posts Somebody I don't even know. And I go, but why don't you like my life? My things are like, I just see your post and I, I like it. I notice it. I go do my life, but I just don't have the time to post a, post a life, right? Yeah. But you don't want to scroll now. We just scroll now. You know what I mean? It's the other generation just- likes and, and, and I think we all want them. But as users... We're just scrolling, right? You don't have time. Multitasking is a thing, right? Mm-hmm. But they do notice. So it is worth 100% to be authentic, down to earth, mm-hmm. and 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 taking these efforts to, to help these children figure out what kind of eggs they like. Excellent. I'm going to use that forever. Like, <laughs> I'm going to use that forever. Um, well, you know what? I am blown away and impressed and grateful that I have you uh, as part of my tribe and connections. And again, I appreciate your kindness when we had so many different problems trying to get you on this podcast. I'm here for you, my dear. I'm Thank here. You. You, got a, you got a new best friend. I love it. And you as well, I, as well, darling, we are here for each other. I will make sure that your information is in the show notes. So if anybody wants to get a hold of you, they can do that. So okay. again, thank you. And um, oh, we'll talk again soon. For sure. Thank you so much. And I'll see you later. <laughs> wow. What a great episode. I hope you had as much fun as I did. If you want more of this in goodness, make sure you subscribe so that you get notifications for future podcasts. And if you found value from this, please share it with others. You can visit our website at cwgdigital.com. This is Erica Bailey. I am your host, and I will see you next time.